Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, let me get the disclaimers out of the way first. I'll just make three disclaimers. Um, we advise TalkTalk, Talk, but we advise incumbent monopoly operators in other markets, and my comments are mine. My views are not Talk Talks. Secondly, um, I make my remarks as a former head of the Office of Fair Trading, where we never got to look at competition issues in regulated sectors because the sector regulators were set up before competition law was introduced in 2000 in this country. And uniquely in Europe, in, in the UK, the regulators do competition, not the um, competition authority. And that frustrated me. We had, we had responsibility for airports, which the CMA no longer has, and we broke up airports doing that. But we've not seen regulators use the competition rules. Uh, uh, generally, there's only been one abuse of dominance case by all I think it's now 11 concurrent regulators. And that was a source of some frustration. I have only one regret that I didn't speak out more about it when I was at the OFT, but I have been since. And I campaigned for the inquiry into energy. I'd be very supportive of the inquiry into banking. And I'm very supportive of an inquiry into energy wearing that hat. But I wear a third hat, and it's probably the reason why I accepted this invitation today, and that is as a customer. Both at home in Marleyburn in central London, so not in the rural area, and in Haymarket in central London, we have appalling internet access. And trying to run a business like that is, is shocking. When I set up my business, I wrote an op-ed for the FT on trying to open a business bank account. It took us several weeks. It was a comedy. Well, at least it was a comedy of having a number of different players to go to. But in telecoms, it's really difficult. And if you live in central London, it shouldn't be like that. So I'm quite angry about that as a customer. And so that's probably why I wanted to speak today. But I have all of those other interests going on as well. So let me tell you um, what I think about this. 20 years ago, there was a really clear focus on regulation here and in the UK on driving um, change through competition, dealing with incumbent fixed um, uh, operators, facilitating entry of mobile operators, and increasing competition across a range of markets. And albeit that happened in an environment of growing markets and new technology, absolutely central to it was a drive to use competition and markets to deliver better outcomes where previously the state had intervened. And it had a huge positive effect. We have more players in mobile and fixed with less concentrated markets, more diverse supply. We've had huge price reductions across a whole range of services. We've had new services and innovation in telecoms, upstream, downstream, and in ancillary services like handsets. And we facilitated huge innovation outside the telecom sector based on it being an input to so many other markets like my little business. So it's hugely positive for consumers, for business, for the single market, the competitors of the European economy. And today, it's very different. At the moment, the regulatory system has evolved in ways that really plays into the hands of incumbents. The market's not growing so rapidly, so we don't see so many new entrants or investors supporting them. The new entrants of 20 years ago are now incumbents, um, very much with strong vested interest to protect in the market. Thirdly, the regulatory process relies heavily on consultation, and incumbent operators have a much stronger voice. As the issues have become more technical and complex, it makes it really difficult for people who are not in the pay or working in the industry and paid by the incumbents to have a voice in this issue. Even I am often nervous about speaking about this, even though I know the sector quite well, because I'm not really within the telecoms sector. And fourthly, the regulatory process has become unbearably legalistic, you know, slowed down by the length of decision making, by the various consultations. In the UK, the Competition Appeals Tribunal has made that a lot worse than it should be, and that's something that should be addressed. On top of that, <clears throat> the regulation and the regulatory debate lacks a clear focus now on competition. We have incumbents arguing for state-based solutions rather than market-based solutions, and sometimes they're succeeding. Um, we're seeing that as a central rationale in the mobile consolidation across Europe, and we're seeing it here. Almunia has made comments about the need for consolidation to achieve economies of scale and help European mobile operators invest. Um, We've seen the spokesperson for the European um, Telecom Network Operators Association saying, talking about the need for, for consolidation to allow our companies to compete more globally. Always a good argument if you want to screw your local customers. Um, we've seen a spokesman for three saying that they're confident that 302 merger will mutually benefit the customers of both companies. Um, we've seen a spokesman for BT talking about investing heavily to ensure the lead, that the UK is a leader. All these arguments about investment are often arguments that are not about competition. 
Thankfully, Commissioner Vestager said incumbent operators argue that if they cannot merge with their rivals, they will be unable to increase their investment. She said, I've heard this claim quite often, but I've not seen evidence that this is the case. Um, there, instead, there is ample evidence that excessive consolidation may lead not only to less competition, but also that it reduces um, the incentives in national markets to innovate. So we have at least a competition commissioner who um, gets that. Um, and then, uh, just relatedly, I mean, I was interested to hear Gavin Patterson calling for a collaborative effort from government. When monopolists call for something to be collaborative, I always get suspicious, but especially when it involves the government. Um, and then the minister, Ed Vasey, first of all, he came out and spoke before Ofcom has considered the issue, and he's a minister, and ministers should know better than that, but it suggested he was captured. And then last week, on Saturday morning, I was listening to him on the radio saying, that only BT can deliver the 10 megabits per second for the last 5%, but then also said in the next sentence or two sentences later, but BT is not a monopoly. And it's sort of an inconsistency, but it just does sound like he's a spokesperson for an incumbent rather than the person who's actually representing consumers in the future of the economy. So when you have a slow regulatory process that is captured by incumbents and politicians who are really looking at, at um, state-based solutions. And let me just address this 10 megabit per second right. If we had a monopoly in the milk market, we might very well need to introduce a right to get milk to remote parts of the country. But it's better to start with the position of what if we didn't have a monopoly, what would we do about this? And the market would probably sort it out. Why not just give money to people in remote areas if you think they need, um, if you think they can't afford internet? But actually, they might need it more than others. Um, the, the, the last time the Prime Minister came up with a clever solution for intervening in a market, it was the energy tariff, limiting it to four tariffs um, three years ago. That has been absolutely shown by the Competition Markets Authority to have made matters worse for competition, worse for consumers in the energy market. So I think it would be much better if the government didn't um, try to come up with these solutions. I'll also just maybe address here, while I'm on it, the anchor tenant argument. Well, actually, if you had a monopoly downstream, that would be the perfect anchor tenant. And that's the logical extension of that argument. I do not think in almost any market I can think of that anybody needs to own the downstream or a large part of the downstream market to justify investment upstream. But we hear these arguments. We've had very few competition cases in telecom in this country. I, I won't um, dwell on that in the interest of time. And I think I just make the point that we're seeing this having negative effects on the market. And other people have made some, some points around this. Um, I'll give you a few facts on this. Um, BT in 2012 had 37% share in copper, but now it has 69% in VDSL. So in the new technology, as market share is higher than in the old technology, we should worry about that uh, with a former incumbent monopolist. BT has been able to replace revenue from call charges with broadband line re rental over what is essentially the same infrastructure, and that's probably protected it from the worst of the disruption from, from new services. Um, in areas where BT faces limited competition, it may be in its interest to uh, rely on the com copper network rather positioning for move to, to um, uh, fiber. Um, Peter Cochran made that point. It's the classic monopoly replacement effect. A monopoly never has as much incentive to replace itself as a, a firm that doesn't already own that existing um, infrastructure. And then on the state aid issue, um, when the state aid was given three years ago, BT was the only provider that in the end was able to bid for it. Um, I think there were a number of issues there. Well, BT had, was the anchor tenant downstream. That, that sort of helped. The smaller providers couldn't bid for it because it was done in such large chunks that they would have had to win several contracts of scale to get it. The National Audit Office has since reported on it, and very negatively, as value for money in public expenditure. And, I mean, there's also evidence that outside the BT UK area, BT has gazumped smaller providers like GigaClear um, and, and others. So... Um, BT has been able to build lighter touch regulation at each stage of development of broad pack technology with something that looks like a regulatory holiday of stepping stones that each time Ofcom comes along to check what it does. And I don't think there is an example, and somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, of BT actually paying a fine for any of this by Ofcom. But each time Ofcom comes along, it takes quite a while to regulate and then if BT is slow, Ofcom sort of slaps it on the wrist and says, don't do this again. And it gives quite a lot of time for BT to, um, uh, to game that system. And that regulatory gaming is worrying. I mean, there are separately, and I won't get rid of them, worries about the BTE merger, and, and um, others have made that point. And there's uh, evidence from Austria and Ireland about the effects of those mergers in, in mobile markets there. And I think a prima facie case that the mobile merger 
that we're looking at in Brussels is just um, uh, the UK one that's in Brussels is, is clearly anti-competitive. So we had a real focus on competition 20 years ago. It delivered huge benefits. Um, that focus is gone. It's not present in the regulatory system, in what we're seeing, and we're seeing negative outcomes emerging in the UK market around competition and far too much state meddling in the market in a way that's only going to make matters worse. So what should we do about this? Well, I think um, I'm going to focus on two things, but dwell mostly on the second. I think the first is to try and put competition clearly back at the centre of our regulatory system. Um, first, there's abundant evidence that competition delivers. Um, we see it delivering in lots of other markets, from low-cost airlines to pay TV, and lots of these have similar um, issues in terms of upstream infrastructure and downstream service provision. Secondly, we do need to challenge arguments about the necessity of, of, of monopoly, whether it's the anchor tenant argument or other arguments. When we announced that we were going to look at the breakup of BT, we were met with a chorus of opposition. And I remember the Financial Times in May 2006 and the Telegraph and others uh, when everybody said, this is a ridiculous idea. You're not, going to get, um, uh, you're not going to get competition between airports. And BAA resisted it. By the way, interestingly, BAA's share price shot up on that public announcement uh, echoing um, the, the, the comment from our New Zealand speaker earlier. Um, but the arguments BAA made were just basically shown afterwards to be totally spurious. And it's so difficult when you're looking at an existing market to imagine how it might be. But I think the airports example shows that we're getting really a lot of competition between different airports to bid for extra capacity at the moment. And the service levels at airports have gone up. So there's a lot of improvement that, that, that comes from that. Um, the, the, um, there are several things the UK could do here. I think, first of all, getting politicians to stop coming up with state-based solutions that they think that they can deliver, especially ones as zany as 10 megabit rights and, um, and, and others. Secondly, um, the competition authorities need to take a stronger advocacy role. I regret I didn't do that. And we have lots of experts in the Competition Markets Authority on this. Thirdly, we should end concurrency and give the CMA the responsibility for competition in telecom and all the other sectors. It's a ridiculous state of affairs. And all of our monopoly, or sorry, former monopoly sectors are suffering from that structural problem. And we should also reform the Competition Appeals Tribunal. We might also want to improve um, the, the range of experts in this that sit as panel members of the CMA, because I think we suffer from a lack of expertise on the CMA panels, and that's also a concern. But and my second point is about the Ofcom um, strategic review and what it should do. In this, I think that Ofcom faces a really critical moment, um, not just for the country, but also for Ofcom. Um, the fixed line um, is still probably the, the, one of the worst bottlenecks in monopoly there, whatever you call it, but it's the strong position BT is one of the biggest bottlenecks in the country. And it's still a huge bottleneck after 20 years. And if it's not solved, it's going to look like a failure of the regulatory system as a whole to deal with what it was originally set up to do, which was breaking up a state-owned monopoly and trying to get a competitive telecom market. And so what, does, what should this involve? And I'm going to argue that it requires Ofcom not just to address the open reach structural issue, but also to look at horizontal concentration in network, looking at whether we should have more than one player in network and whether open reach should be broken up horizontally, and also whether BT retail, should, whether its structure downstream should be looked at. And let me just work through each of those. So on the vertical question, and lots of people have made arguments about this, so I'll, I'm, I'm not going to be exhaustive in doing it, and, and Vanessa and others have made good financial arguments about it. But um, I think it's very clear that vertically integrated players have an incentive and ability to favor their own downstream um, operations. You know, BT's overall spend on access networks is flat, and so the much, ex much publicized expenditure on NGA has come at the expense of investments in non-GEA uh, lines, and um, those, are, those are the ones that standard um, BB and superfast broadband refer. The system requires at the moment on um, complex and expensive regulation to regulate access. The system is far less um, uh, effective than I, would, uh, than, than I would have expected it to be. Advising Talk Talk, I mean, I've been shocked at the amount of resource that a small company like that needs to put into regulation and the amount of senior management time it takes it. We would be much better off if Talk Talk didn't need me. And I prefer that as an outcome, as a customer in the market, than the current one where um, companies like mine make money because we have inefficient, slow-moving um, regulatory systems that play to incumbency. 
Um, it, fails, it totally fails to address quality. I mean, this is one of the problems you have. You start regulating price, then you have to regulate something else, then you have to regulate quality. And this is where um, Ofgem went. And if Ofcom thinks it can fix the open reach problem by regulating more, it should just look at what Ofgem did and the mistakes Ofgem meant and made and, and learn lessons from that. Um, it's interesting, the um, experience from mobile mass, actually, which I only came across recently, is very interesting. So Ernst & Young report on mobile infrastructure just shows that on independent um, infrastructure in masts in Europe, there are on average three providers per independent mast, but only 1.3 when it's an owner, uh, an MNO owner mast. So even in mobile, when you have independent ownership of the upstream structure, you get an almost threefold increase in, in access. Now, Ofcom dodged this issue in 2005. That, that may or may not have been the right decision then. Personally, I don't think it was, but um, reasonable people uh, might differ. But there are two reasons why Ofcom needs to be very careful um, this time. First, it's marking its own homework. And I think if it's going to be credible, it's going to have to lean into this issue or pass it to the CMA. Secondly, um, stopping short of, of separation would increase the amount of regulation that Ofcom would have to do in the future. And competition law generally eschews um, behavioral remedies, which require more and more monitoring over time in favor of clean structural remedies, and so should Ofcom. And so I think for both those reasons, Ofcom has to be very careful that it itself has inbuilt structural biases on this issue, and it needs to come and look at it afresh. And um, I think the, the, I'll just say that the test for reference to the Competition and Markets Authority is so clearly met with this issue. The test is, are there likely to be adverse effections, uh, effects on competition? Would a reference to the Competition uh, commission, uh, uh, commission or CMA be proportionate to those? Is there availability of available remedies? And is that the appropriate forum to do it? And I think those, those issues are met in spades. You can have a legal dancing debate about whether we can do this because of the EU um, and the EU framework. And, and good luck to anybody who thinks that's a good argument to run in the context of Brexit, um, that we, we should protect our monopoly because of our uh, EU framework. So let me then turn to upstream network. Ofcom shouldn't just look at the vertical issue, but look at this as well. We need to challenge any incumbent views that we require a national um, monopoly to deliver a national solution. And there are two separate issues here. The first is competition between networks. Monopolies are lazy, and even when they do invest, um, they have an incentive to do so inefficiently or a way that doesn't react to the customer. When the um, bus monopoly in Dublin 25 years ago was forced to open up a bus route from Dublin Airport to the city center, it ran the bus route to the headquarters of the bus company and it was only when, nine years later, after huge lobbying, an entrant got in that it actually ran a, a service to the city center and the hotels. Um, I've seen so many examples of that in the competition world. So yes, you can demonstrate lots of investment. But how as a monopoly do you prove the investment is going where the customers really want it unless you have some competition? It's not clear that the market as a whole lends itself to nat natural monopoly. And we have lots of players like Virgin, community-based solutions like Gigaclear, the experiment in York that, that Talk Talk and Sky have done that are looking at doing things in a different way. So even if you, um, you get competition at looking at different business models, different ways of doing it, and no one company ever has a monopoly on innovation, it's the reason why when we take on large, um, large companies, we worry, they always argue, you're going to harm innovation if you look at us. Well, I always worry you're going to harm innovation outside those companies. And uh, you know, I can quote Michael O'Leary of Ryanair on, on gold plating of Terminal 5. Um, I can quote, uh, I can look, look at the, um, the you know, examples like Sweden. The second argument is competition to be the monopoly. So if you think, well, there's some areas where we can only have a monopoly. And I think that, by the way, where the monopoly is and where we have competitive networks should be really left to the market, not something we, we design from on high. But that's critically important in the current debate, both about rolling out fiber, uh, uh, broadband to rural areas, but also on upgrading. I mean, there should be a real debate about if we're going to upgrade to fiber, uh, sh you know, should we have r strong competition in doing that and look at lots of different providers and have diversity? Yes, we should. So the, the, the question is, do you need to, would it be a good idea to, to break open reach into regional, um, uh, regional monopolies or regional firms, some of them monopolies, some of them not? Would it be a good idea to look at what's happening with what George Osborne is doing on Manchester and other cities and try to think about how we think about network provision underlying uh, building a, a broader geographical base for our economic activity going forward? Yes, it probably would. And these are the sort of questions we should be asking. Let me finally and very quickly deal with downstream, and I'll say less here. 
BT's market share in the downstream retail level could potentially have an adverse effect on competition. I think that question should be asked. So um, in a number of inquiries recently, both energy and banking, a central issue was this question as to whether large firms had rump, a rump of profitable, sticky um, customers that gave them um, an advantage. And I think there are two ways, if this is true, that it could harm competition. First, it could foreclose upstream network entry. So somebody's trying to come along and build an upstream network. If there's a rump of sticky customers, it might be very difficult for them to get access to them. And then being owned by the company you compete with upstream might make that more difficult than if they were owned by an independent entity downstream. Secondly, it is possible um, to easier to engage in anti-competitive strategies like margin squeeze if you have a rump of customers who are not vulnerable to moving, and especially if you can identify them. And Ofcom has been extremely cautious about bringing margin squeeze cases. There's a wonderful example a few years ago where they, they found a margin squeeze but decided they wouldn't take the case forward because they couldn't see an impact. Um, and their whole approach has been, let's solve the problem, let's not think about deterrence and how bringing cases deters others in future. So um, BT, is BT's share high enough to justify that? Well, the other inquiries, and that's not the main feature, involved market shares much lower than BT's as a, a cause of concern. But the retail market in telecoms is at least as concentrated as energy, retail banking, aggregates, and private healthcare, which were the last four markets to get refer referred. And several of those markets exhibited concerns with switching costs, and, and we have concerns with switching costs in fixed line here as well. So I don't know, I'm not going to say that's the right answer, but the right answer is these issues need to be looked at, they need to be addressed. And, and Ofcom, if it's not going to do something very radical in this market, it needs to hand the whole thing over to the CMA so that at least we have an independent uh, look at this issue. So let me conclude. 20 years ago, we had a very um, clear focus on competition at the center of, of, of telecom regulation. It yielded huge benefits. 20 years later, the regulatory system lacks that focus. It's dominated by incumbents. The regulatory process is slow. I, I wouldn't wish that on Ofcom. It's a, it's a bad situation if you're in Ofcom to be working in. So this is not a, just a, it's not a criticism of Ofcom in that regard. Um, Ofcom shouldn't be doing the competition stuff in my view. I've differed with Ed Richards and, and other people on that over the years. And I, I still think the evidence is mounting on my side of that argument. Um, there's an opportunity for Ofcom to change my view on that. Um, so I think in addition to changing the regulatory system to make it more pro-competition and less pro-incumbent, um, Ofcom really needs to make sure that it doesn't dodge this issue. My final point would be that a really easy solution for everybody would be what happened in New Zealand, for BT to wake up and work out that actually it might be in its and everybody else's best interest to do this voluntarily. Thank you very much. John, do you, do you have time for the old question? Yeah. Great. So, um, uh, for, Forest of Hand goes up. We, we, are, we are over time, so I'm going to take t t two or three or four. I um, hope they come together uh, and then come to John for closing remarks. So, can you put your hands up again, uh, uh, people? There we are. So, there's, there's two on this side. So, can we go? Uh, who's, got, who's got the. Oh, so, oh, sorry, sorry, we've got a microphone. Hi, go, uh, go <coughs> Thank you. Julian Ashworth from BT. I'm just sure. curious how you, how you find that we have a dominant position downstream when Ofcom's own numbers show that we've got the lowest market share of any major uh, country in the EU when it comes to uh, broadband, which is the market definition, and it's 32%. There is no market definition for super fast broadband, and, and your comments almost imply you've forgotten that Virgin exists. If you look at that compared to Sky, which has an over 70% share in its market of pay TV, how does that, how does that accord with the review of what must be done to sort out competition and sort out monopolies? Well, Jojo, those are quite specific. Do you want, do you want to deal with that? Oh, I, so I didn't say BT was dominant. I think it's the market structure downstream that justifies uh, reference, so it would cover everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yep, David Stewart from Townhouse. We can debate the um, yep. ins and outs of the appeal process another time, but suffice it to say there is another view about the, the need for effective appeals. But I wanted to come back to this question about open reach being split into different regional companies. Just to, to clarify what you were talking about, do you mean something like what we see in water or, or electricity distribution where you get comparative competition? Or do you mean something like the, the breakup of AT&T where you break up the companies and then you allow them to be vertically integrated and compete sort of on an access basis? Because I, I, those are obviously very different models. Um, I, I think that the, 
the issue should be looked at by Ofcom or the CMA, the right answer needs to come out of a very rigorous process. And I think both of those could be possible answers, as could not do anything about it coming out of that. The question is whether we should look at this or not. And the problem in 2005 was that Ofcom came up with a quick solution or a solution with BT without having that ex external scrutiny. And I think it needs either a radical solution by Ofcom or that external scrutiny. I'm not saying what I think the answer should be. I'm saying that the evidence for the question being asked in a thorough and rigorous way is overwhelming. Thank you. And so do you want to jump up so John yeah, sorry, can see? Steve, Steve Malcolm, Maris. I'm interested to hear, in your position as an advising talk talk, and your sort of competitive regulatory backdrop, whether you think it's been wise for them to raise line rental pricing in line with every other operator for the last four years in the UK in what looks like a sort of collaborative pricing move. Do you think that positions them well in discussions with regulators going forward? Do you think that raises the risks possibly of an OFT investigation at some point in pricing practices? Well, if, if, if I thought collusion between all the people who are in the room today was the most significant competition problem in the telecom sector, um, I, would have, I, would, I would have addressed that issue, but I don't see um, evidence of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and do we have a, those questions to be answered so quickly? We've got time for what? Is there a hand right at the back? Sir? That's it. So la we'll go to the last question. Quick question. Tex Edwards, KLR, we're investors. A long, short question. Would you be long or would you be short for the BT share price if structural separation was forced upon it? Thank you. There are others in the room so much better qualified than me to answer that question. Thank you. Well, well um, uh, John, th thank you very much indeed.